What I have for you today is a case about taxation and human rights treaties. Um, I think it's interesting to once in a while look at these to remember that they are there and actually there are quite a number of them that are quite recent as well. And what we'll be looking at is the case of Bragi uh, Gudmundur, I think, Christianson versus Iceland. It is a case about Navy's Edem, so you can't be punished twice. <clears throat> and it's a case about um, Mr. Bragi had some um, option contracts or future contracts which he uh, which he earned money on it, which he quote unquote forgot to put onto his tax return. So let's see what this is all about. The case is decided by the, by the European Court of, on Human Rights, and that's the building of the European Court on Human Rights here that you can see in the background. It's in Strasbourg, and the facts are described as follows. The present case concerns proceedings against the applicant for tax code violation. Pursuant to administrative proceedings, the applicant's taxes were reassessed and a 25% surcharge was imposed. Subsequently, pursuant to criminal proceedings, the applicant was convicted of aggravated, aggravated tax offences and sentenced to three months imprisonment and a fine of approximately 84,000 euros. The applicant complains that he was tried twice for the same offence in violation of the Navy's and Eden principle enshrined in Article 4 of Protocol 7 of the Convention. <clears throat> and then if we see what happened in terms of the tax proceedings on the 3rd of May 2011, the Directorate of Tax Investigations initiated an audit of the applicant's tax returns for the years 2007 and 2008. And the audit was aimed at examining whether the applicant had failed to report his financial income, including income arising from forward contracts concluded with the bank. And the outcome of that was that by a decision of 30 November 2012, the Directorate of Internal Revenue reassessed the applicant's taxes for 2007 and 2008, um, uh, revising uh, upwards from the income declared by respectively uh, 43,000 and 48,000 uh, kroners, which comes to about euros 266,000 and 294,000, quite, quite a bit of money. In addition, the Directorate of Internal Revenue imposed a 25% surcharge, noting that taxpayers could not absolve themselves of their responsibility to file correct tax returns by entrusting others with the task of preparing and filing them. And what happened here was Johansson I, I don't think he blamed his advisor. I think he, he notified the authorities after the audit has begun that, oh, by the way, you should also make sure to tax my, my income from, from futures, if, if I understand the facts correctly. <clears throat> and obviously, doing that before you get audited is, is, is fine in many countries. Announcing all your extra income once the audit has started is, is a little late. In terms of criminal proceedings, um, by letter of 12 November 2012, the Directorate of Tax Investigations referred the applicant's case to the Office of the Special Prosecutor for Investigation, forwarding its orders report concerning the applicant. Right. So now we are trying to also uh, prosecute him criminally. And on the same day, the applicant was informed by letter that his case had been referred to the Office of the Special Prosecutor. And then on 21 May 2014, so three years later, the prosecutor indicted the applicant for major tax offences. The applicant was indicted for having filed substantially incorrect tax returns for the years 2007-2008, failing to declare profits from the sale of shares and from forward swaps. So you see now they talk about swaps here. And, 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 and the issue here is, you know, um, whether, uh, so, so I'm saying, I mean, the, you know, this was in 2014, the other was in 2011. And, and the issue here to, well, was to what, to what extent this is one case or whether these were two separate cases, right? And, 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 the, and, and the criminal proceedings um, have invited him to do to, 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 for questioning, which he, which he came for twice. They uh, also questioned some witnesses which were, which were questioned during tax proceedings, and they questioned some additional witnesses, right? And then uh, what we see here in point 17 at the hearing, the district court decided at the applicant's request to postpone a hearing against him pending a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights concerning double jeopardy, which is again Nabis and Edem, because Mr. Johansson has claimed, Christianson, sorry, has claimed, listen, I already paid a 25% tax fee uh, penalty. There's no reason to also prosecute me criminally. 
Um, and then the district court disagreed with him, sentenced the applicant to three months imprisonment, suspended for two years, and the payment of a fine of 83,000 euros. In fixing the fine, the district court took into account the tax surcharges that had already been imposed on the, on the applicant, albeit without providing any details regarding the calculation in this respect. So this is the background. And, and, and A 10 second commercial. If you want to learn more about international taxation or transfer pricing, or treat yourself to an all-round update, or if you want your team to learn or stay updated, please visit my online courses. This case then order ended up in the, in, in the Icelandic Supreme Court. The applicant lodged an appeal against the judgment with the Supreme Court on 11 April 2016. But the Supreme Court decided on its own initiative to postpone the hearing of the case until 4 September 2017, pending delivery of the court's judgment in the case. And the court here is the European Court of Judgment, uh, European Court of, of Human Rights, um, in the case of Jon Askier Johansson and others versus Iceland. So you can see there were a number of cases before the European Court of Justice uh, of, of Human Rights, which, um, <clears throat> which, which kind of upheld the Icelandic courts because they wanted to hear what what the outcome of those were. But when the, the European Court of Human Rights took too long, the Icelandic courts made their own decisions. And this is what the Supreme Court did as well. By judgment of 21 December 2000, September 2017, the Supreme Court upheld the applicant's conviction and sentence. So we done it with three years and, 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 and 80, uh, I think $80,000 euros, right? Um, the judgment firstly found that the two sets of proceedings against the applicant had constituted dual criminal proceedings concerning the same facts within the meaning of Article 4 of Protocol No. 7 to the Convention. It noted that the European Court of Human Rights did not consider that such dual proceedings constituted a violation of the provision in question per se, but that such proceedings had to fulfill the requirement that they were sufficiently connected both in time and in substance in order to avoid duplication. And, 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 and so what the court, the Supreme Court is referring to here is that maybe see them apply if you are if you are prosecuted for the same crime in two separate distinctions. However, if you are in a country where when you commit tax fraud or tax evasion or avoidance, whatever you want to call it, and there is an administrative penalty for doing that, you know, the, but that administrative penalty may be set in such a way that it's not, it, it is called a criminal charge, it's treated as a criminal charge, but it's not a full criminal charge because the courts then leave it for the criminal justice system to do the remaining of the charge and then that way they are combined and, and they form one whole. And obviously this brings up a lot of uh, complexity because now the question is when is it one case under two different systems and when is it two separate cases for which Nabis Edom says you can't do that. And then the Supreme Court said, the Supreme Court concluded that the proceedings against the applicant have, compli have complied with the requirement that they be sufficiently connected both in time and in substance and had therefore not violated Article 4 of Protocol 7 of the Convention. So, so that is what the Supreme Court said. And the Supreme Court looked at these decisions such as the Johansson uh, and others versus Iceland from the European Court of Human Rights, but the Supreme Court interpreted it wrong. <clears throat> because but if you see what the European Court of Human Rights said, it started by saying the applicant complained that through the imposition of tax surcharges and the subsequent criminal trial and conviction for major tax offenses, he had been tried and punished twice for the same offense. Okay? And then they quote Article 4 of Protocol 7, which says that you can't do this. And Paragraph 1 says no one shall be liable to be tried or punished again in criminal proceedings under the jurisdiction of the same state for an offense for which he has already been finally acquitted or convicted. Right? The provisions of the preceding paragraph shall not prevent the reopening of a case in accordance with the law and penal procedure of that state concerned if there is evidence of new or newly discovered facts. And that is clearly not applicable here. So it really is paragraph one and this idea of you know whether this was just uh, one procedure broken into two parts or whether these were two separate procedures. And the court breaks down what it needs to do. And I think it's quite helpful. The court says the court has to determine whether the imposition of tax surcharges was criminal in nature, whether the criminal offense for which the applicant was prosecuted and convicted 
was the same as that for which the tax charges were imposed. And then they say the notion of the same offences, the idem, in the element of nabis and idem. And then whether there was a final decision and whether there was a duplication of proceedings, right? The bis in nabis and idem. And the court then starts by saying, you know, was there, well, was there a position of surcharges? Was that of a criminal nature? And the court says, well, basically neither the Icelandic government nor Mr. Christensen said that these uh, surcharges, in other words, a 25% tax, additional tax, was not a criminal, or it was not a um, proceeding in connection with the criminal offence. So therefore, there's been two cases, right? Um, whether the criminal offence for which the applicant was prosecuted and convicted was the same as that for the tax surcharges that were imposed, and then the court says the court agrees with the parties. The applicant's conviction and the imposition of the tax surcharges, sur surcharges were based on the same failure to declare income. Moreover, the tax proceedings and the criminal proceedings concerned the same period of time and the same amount of evaded taxes. Consequently, the idem part of Nabis idem principle is present. Yes, it was the same, the same crime that's being prosecuted twice. And then the question, the, the, the court raises an interesting issue. Um, because one of the points that the court apparently needs to go through is, you know, was there a final decision in the first case? In, in, in other words, was there a final decision <clears throat> in the tax case, right? But but now if you think about the, 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 le the dilemma that we're looking at here, and that is, you know, whether this is one extended um, uh, investigation broken into two parts, first a tax part and then a criminal part, or whether these are two separate um, prosecutions, I mean, if it, if it is one, one extended investigation, then there doesn't need to be a final decision, right? So that's what the court says here. It says, in the past, before determining whether there has been a duplication of proceedings, in some cases, the court has under, first undertaken an examination of whether, and if so, when there was a final decision in one set of proceedings, right? Potentially barring the continuation of the other set. However, the court says, the issue of whether a decision is final is devoid of relevance if there is no real duplication of the proceedings, but rather a combination of proceedings considered to constitute an integrated whole. In the present case, the court does not find it necessary to determine whether and when the first set of proceedings, the tax proceedings, became final, as this circumstance does not affect the assessment given below of the relationship between them. So the court says, you know, we, we, if these are extended proceedings, then we don't need this final decision, right? Technically, but that means that if the court has finally decided that these were not extended proceedings, but two separate decisions, um, then one could argue the court should have come back to this point and said, you know, so was one of them final or not? And the court does that kind of indirectly. You'll see what we mean. So now we get to, to the beef of this, of, of this decision, and that is whether there was a duplication of proceedings. And, and, and the court says, in the Grand Chamber judgment of A, B, A and B versus Norway, and, and the Norwegian and, 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 and the Icelandic taxes were very similar here. The court explained that Article 4 of Protocol 7 had not excluded the conducting of dual proceedings provided that certain conditions were fulfilled. To avoid a duplication of trial or punishment, the respondent state had to demonstrate convincingly that the dual proceedings were sufficiently closely connected in substance and in time, right? And this is where it's all, what it's all about. Were these proceedings before the tax and before the, the criminal investigation, were they sufficiently closely connected in substance and in time in order to be combined in an integrated manner so as to form a coherent whole? Not only the purpose pursued and the means used to achieve them should in essence be complementary and linked in time, but also the possible consequences of organizing the legal treatment, such, sh uh, such should be proportionate and foreseeable, right? And, and the court will then also see, I mean, has this been foreseeable, etc., right? And then first the, the court starts by saying, is there a connection in substance? And then, you know, are there complementarity of purposes? The court is, ex accepts that the two sets of proceedings pursued a complementary purpose in addressing the issue of the taxpayer's failure to comply. So in other words, yes, they were supposed to be complementary to each other, even though the criminal investigation did not automatically and always have to be following the initial tax uh, additional assessment, right? That there was another point made by the court. It's not so that you must always go through the criminal procedures, but if you do, 
it, there, there is a logical extension there. And then we come to the foreseeability because it says, you know, you also have to look at it from the suspect's point of view. Was this a foreseeable consequence of what he's done? And then the court says it must determine whether the duality of the proceedings concerned was a foreseeable consequence of the same impugned conduct. And then it says the court accepts that the consequences of the applicant's conduct were foreseeable in this case. Right. So he could have known this. And then uh, is there a, a avoidance of duplication in the collection and assessment um, of e evidence? Um, it says the court must assess whether the relevant sets of proceedings were conducted in such a manner as to avoid as far as possible any duplication. And then later in the paragraph, however, it is not clear to what extent the prosecutors investigated relied on findings made by the Directorate of Tax Investigations to avoid duplication. And the issue here was the prosecutor got all the tax authorities files um, and, and he clearly looked at it. But the question is, you know, to what extent? Because why did he why did he interview Mr. Christianson twice again? Why did he interview the other witness that was uh, interviewed by, 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 by the by the tax authorities? Um, to his, to his defense, he then uh, interviewed three more witnesses. But why did he do these other two points? Right. And the court says it is clear that the prosecutor undertook an investigation that lasted 18 months, quite long, because the length of the prosecution is also an issue. Nevertheless, during the course of their investigation, the prosecutor interviewed the applicant twice, even though he had previously been questioned twice by the director of tax investigation. The prosecutor also interviewed the witness that had previously been interviewed by the director of tax investigation, along with three additional witnesses. The apparent overlap in the two investigations in the present case is considerable, is what the court decides. In the light of this, the court harbors, harbors serious doubt as to whether the two sets of proceedings were conducted so as to avoid, to the extent possible, duplication in the obtaining and assessment of the, in, of the, of the, of the evidence. Right? So he says there is duplication, but let's see um, how much. The conclusion in the light of the foregoing consideration particularly the overlap of the two investigations, there is serious doubt as to whether the connection in substance between the two sets of proceedings was sufficiently close as to form a coherent integrated whole, right? I mean, because if it's a coherent integrated whole, you do not need to duplicate. And then when you, when you look at the, so, so there was, a, uh, whether there's a connection in time, the, this is where things really go wrong. The, the court says the prosecutor indicated the applicant uh, indicted, sorry, the applicant on 21 May 2014. By judgment of 15 March 2016, the district court convicted the applicant for major tax uh, offences. On 21 September 2017, the Supreme Court upheld the applicant's conviction. Thus, the overall length of the two sets of proceedings from the initiation of the order until the Supreme Court's final ruling was about six years and four months, right? And, 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 and then there comes a number of appointment of, of issues there. Uh, in, in terms of assessment, he says the proceedings were thus conducted in parallel for 11 months. Now, if they are conducted in parallel, then it means that it's one and the same procedure. That's why uh, the Icelandic government said, you know, but they were in parallel. But, uh, but out of six years and four months, they were parallel for 11 months only, right? And then the court goes on to say the criminal proceedings then con continued for three years after the Internal Revenue Board's ruling became final, a substantial amount of time. The court notes that a substantial part of the delay in the proceedings before the district court was due to the applicant's request that a hearing care of the case be stayed pending the European Court of Human Rights judgment in the case of uh, Jon Asger Johansson and others. So, so, you know, part of the of the length of time was also because of, of Mr. Christiansson himself. But then the court goes on to say, nevertheless, the 11 months during which the two sets of proceedings ran parallel constitute only a small portion of the six years. In addition, the fact that the proceedings ran in parallel at all was due only to the fact that the, that the applicant lodged an appeal in the tax proceedings, prolonging those proceedings by one year and almost four months. Right. So if he hasn't uh, uh, appealed there, there would not have been this, the, 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 this overlap. Had he not done so, the decision of the Director, the General, uh, Director of Internal Revenue would have become final on the 28th of February. 2013, two months before the applicant was first questioned by the prosecutor. In view of the above, 
the court finds that the connection in time between the two sets of proceedings was insufficient to avoid a duplication of the proceedings. So th this is where, where things go completely wrong and the court concludes, the court thus finds that the dual proceedings against the applicant were neither sufficiently connected in substance nor in time as to avoid duplication of the proceedings. Consequently, the applicant was tried and punished for the same or substantially the same conduct by different authorities in two different sets of proceedings that lacked the required connection. Therefore, the, there has therefore been a violation of Article 4 of Protocol Number 7 of the Convention. In other words, Navy's idiom was broken. And then the judgment of the court is, you know, it declares unanimously the complaint is, 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 is admissible. But then it holds by four votes to three that there has been a violation of Article 4 of uh, Protocol Number 7. And, and this is interesting because there were three dissenting judges and they actually all said, you know, we, we, we think this is one and the same procedure. And, and, and they find different excuses for, for why Iceland actually has run one procedure and not two. I mean, such as the, you know, the, the fact that they were waiting for, 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 the, for, for the Court of uh, Human Rights to decide on issues like that. Um, but nonetheless, the majority of the Court of Human Rights decided that, that, that Christian Son uh, was prosecuted twice and therefore he won the case. And as a consequence of this, um, <clears throat> he got the re restitution of the 86,000 euros that he had to pay as fine. He got 5,000 euros um, uh, for non-pecuniary damage, and then he also got 16,800 euros uh, for, for, for legal charges. And, and it must be said that the Icelandic government were very much against the last two. Um, and, and, and maybe Mr. Christiansson got them because of the, uh, of, of the Icelandic government's um, issue on this. I hope you enjoyed this case. Next week will probably be a transfer pricing case. Um, see you then. Bye for now.